Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, my name's Caroline, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Caroline. We love you, Caroline. Oh, this is great. I am so grateful to be alive and sober today, and thank you, Alcoholics Anonymous, for my life. I uh, walked into Alcoholics Anonymous on November 10th, 2000. I haven't had a drink or a drug since, and I am so grateful. That is, that is amazing. When I walked into that, into that room, uh, it was the Misfits meeting at the Triangle Club. I, you know, I had... I had a gun and a bottle at home, and I couldn't go home because I couldn't not drink, um, despite everything that I, all of my great thinking that I had done, uh, trying to figure this thing out. I was a, a person who drank for my health. Um, you know, I had high cholesterol, and, you know, it says on television you're supposed to have two glasses of wine every night. And I would, I would drink wine or I would drink vodka and, you know, fresh squeezed orange juice or grapefruit juice, get my vitamins. And boy, sure enough, there was the end of the bottle, you know, and it was every night, you know, I'd wake up and, and that pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I wasn't going to drink like that. I was just going to have one. And I didn't know what had happened and I didn't know how I'd gotten home and trying to piece all of that together in the middle of the night. And I don't do that anymore. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I just have to go pee. You know, it's not a big deal. You know, and I and one of the things uh, I'm here. This is my first wacky paw, any kind of paw thing. I feel I (laughs) I feel very old, uh, but uh, you know, I'm very very happy to be here. I love the energy in the room, and I was invited to bring some archives here. And Lori has already set up the room and has put most of the wacky paw uh, archives in there. She's done a beautiful job. It's upstairs on the uh, boardrooms. Uh, there's also a meditation room up there. Uh, Grapevine will be up there. I'll be bringing some archives from Central Office, just a little bit of stuff tomorrow. And, uh, you know, service has been an incredibly important part of my recovery. I was somebody that was always interested in myself and my own needs and gimme, 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 gimme. And I had no idea that the way to that self-satisfaction, that that way to peace, that that way to joy was to give to others, and you've given me that opportunity. And for that, I am very, very grateful, and I'm looking forward to this event. There's some great stuff going on. I have no idea what half of it is, but I'm going to be there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Brian from Boise. I'm Brian. I'm an alcoholic from Boise, Idaho. We love you, Brian. Lots and lots and lots. We love you. Caroline, thank you for uh, getting us started off tonight on service. That's actually what I wanted to talk about, too. I mean, near and dear to my heart, when I came back to AA the second time, and I was ready and willing to do whatever my sponsor told me to do, he gave me it simple. He said, you know what? This disease isn't about alcohol. It's not about drugs. It's not about all that. It's about selfishness and self-centeredness. And the only way to overcome that is being of service to another person. You know, there's a lot of things we feel like, oh, I can't help another person when I'm new. But just giving somebody a phone call and asking how their day is, giving them a ride, going out and doing coffee before the meeting, after the meeting, that kind of thing makes a big difference in my life. And if I turn around and give it to somebody else, it can make a big difference in their life. And then I also got to see how I need some power in order to do that because I'm, I'm afraid to help somebody, right? I need some guidance in how to do it because God seeks the willing and not the, qual- uh, the willing and not the qualified. 
You know, if I'm actually willing to go out there and help somebody, God's going to give me that direction. So I see the need for getting this higher power, which I had no spirituality when I got in here. I had never prayed before. I hated religion. Thought everyone that went to church was fucking nuts, right? Turn around a couple of years later, I'm all about God. You know, I'm all about my higher power living in my life every fucking minute of every day because that's what I need, you know. And then I'll also see that those fears come up uh, repeatedly when I try to help somebody else out. Can I do it? You know, can I jump up on stage and just talk at a moment's notice? Um, <laughs> and those are the things that are blocking me, right? And that's what the steps are for. So I don't just get shoved the steps saying, like, you got to do these. I start saying, oh, man, you know, if I'm going to do this service thing, which makes me feel good when I try, I have to do some more work. I have to put some more effort into it, you know? And when we look at the people around us who are actually staying sober, it's the people who've worked this program, it's a 12-step program, who've worked all those steps and stay in and be of service and continue to work steps with their sponsees and go, you know, be of service on amazing area levels, you know? Um, those are the people who can make, like, double-digit sobriety and, and last and be happy, and that's what I want. You know, um, there's some really grim statistics out there. I just want to tell you, those statistics are bullshit. Okay? They're fucking bullshit. Because it's like counting six people at the same time. Do you know what? I, I wasn't ready my first time either. You count me as a statistic every time I come in and out of the door, right? But it's when I'm willing. And when I actually take the steps that, you know what? I'm going to have some lasting recovery. I'm going to have lasting sobriety. I'm going to have a higher power in my life that I can rely on. And thank you so much. I fucking love Wipaw. I love Wacky Pod. This is my favorite conference. Seriously. I feel like this is the most spiritual one of them all. <laughs> For sure. I'm so glad to be here. Guys, um, one last thing. If you see somebody sitting alone in the corner, go reach out, you know? <laughs> Try to stick men with the men and women with the women, but, you know, don't let people be lonely here, right? <laughs> right on, Brian. Our next speaker is Johnny from San, San Luis Obispo. Right on. Hey, my name's Johnny. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. I love you, too. Uh, I'm so grateful to be here and grateful to be sober today and be in a um, convention of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, couldn't stop drinking, drank every day horribly, and uh, didn't know how to stop. Okay. Found my way into the rooms because of uh, DUI, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I didn't stay that time, though, because I didn't... I didn't <laughs> There's no way I was going to get a sponsor and ask for help and stuff like that, so I just stopped going. And, um, you know, that was the worst year and a half of my life. And I, I ended up asking for help and came back into the rooms, and I got a sponsor right away and worked the steps in my life today as, much, as best as I can. Um, you know, I have a higher power today, which is huge. And I, I, thank, um, I thank God every day for this beautiful life that I almost missed. And I just uh, can't believe uh, that I'm here. It's my second YPAW convention. I just went to the Icky Paw. It's good stuff. There's some lot, lots of power in this room. If you haven't found God yet, you might just happen to find him tonight. <laughs> I love I love the topic of service. It seems like that's what it's the topic, and um, you know, service is what keeps me involved and and keeps me um, alive in Alcoholics Anonymous. I love reaching my hand out to the newcomer, and um, I love seeing that spark happen in other people, and and just seeing growth all around me. I, I try and stick by, you know, the winners as they say, and and um, and help out as best as I can. And I, I just we just started a, um, a committee in San Luis Obispo, and so yeah, floppy paw, there it is. So check us out, we're up and coming. Nice. <laughs>
Not yet. I'm just very grateful to be here. I can't wait for this weekend, and I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. And our last opening speaker is Teresa from Boise. I'm Teresa. I'm an alcoholic drug addict. Hi, Teresa. We love you, Teresa. Lots and lots and lots. Hello. My sobriety date is 6-19-89. I got sober when I was three. So uh, when I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was one of the youngest ones in the rooms. And I remember sitting around, looking around, and there's all these old people sitting there, and none of them smiled, and there was no energy in the room, right? And I've always had a lot of energy. And, and uh, you know, I, they would always say, oh, you don't belong in Alcoholics Anonymous. I spilt more than you drank. I was like, well, if you didn't spill so much, <laughs> maybe you would have hit your bottom at 19. <laughs> you know, um... One of the things that I know indefinitely, this is, uh, I got uh, to be programmed for Wacky Paw in 08. And uh, that was, I, I, you know, I know what you guys are going through, and it's just an amazing, incredible experience. And uh, I had a short term on advisory. That was fun. Um, it was a long meeting. <laughs> It was fun, though. I love those people. You know, um, one of the things for me is um, everybody says girls with the girls, guys with the guys, you know, whatever. You know, uh, for me, it's about fellowship. It's about reaching out. It's about helping whoever needs the help. You know, I was at a meeting the other day, and there was a drunk guy standing in the driveway. And he was standing there. He was just swaying back and forth. And I walk into the room, and there's four guys sitting in the room. And I'm like, hey, there's a drunk guy in the driveway. And they're like, yeah, he's pretty fucked up. And I was like, <laughs> and you guys are just sitting in here. I'll be back. You know, and, and I mean, it's like, really, honestly, you know, the... the being able to give what's been given to me so freely. The 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 Traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, staying sober one day at a time, the ins, the outs, the trials and errors, marriages, divorces, deaths, you know, uh, and, and staying sober no matter what. You know, I didn't have to go through anything by myself unless I chose to. You know, and that was one of the things that I learned in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous is that I'm not alone. And I can relate to those old guys, you know, and those old women. And, you know, I, and I remember sitting there and I was trying to listen for similarities. They lost everything. I lost this. I lost this. I lost my kids. I got a divorce. I was 19. I was like, I got a place to stay, you know, some food now, people that like me. You know, they put me in service position for the first time and they told me to put dances together. I'm I'm going to age myself a little bit. So it was like a mosh pit. So they said I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's all I knew at that age, you know. And, and, and for me, you know, today I have to say that, uh, that the, the newcomers is what keeps me sober. The newcomers teaches me and keeps me where I need to be and realizing that I'm an alcoholic drug addict, I'm beyond human aid, and that I'm just as crazy as they are. You know, there's girls that walk in the rooms just like me, just like I did. You know, they're all just, you know, and, and it was, and that's how I was. People were like, sit down and shut up, and I'd be, you know, and I... I couldn't do it for long. I still can't do it very long. But it's like, you know, one of the things that I know is that those are the women that saved me today. Those are the men that saved me today. You know, those are the, the alcoholics that tell my story every single day that talks about, as a very young alcoholic, that the party was over at 15. You know, looking forward to, to getting up and going, man, we're going to get so loaded this weekend, and I'm going to do that person, I'm going to beat this person up, and we're going to do this, and it's going to be a great time. That was done at 15. You know, I had to get up and, and get loaded. That's what I did. That's all I knew. When I walked into the rooms, they said, you don't have to do that anymore. If you follow a few basic suggestions, work the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, get a big book, go to meetings, and stay sober one day at a time. Don't use in-between meetings. You know, and they're like, this is Alcoholics Anonymous, so I can smoke pot and come in? Is that okay? You know, I was an idiot, but I knew that for me, <laughs> for me, I tried everything. I tried everything in my possible way to keep from having to deal with the one thing that I didn't want to deal with ever in my entire life, and that was me. 
you know, and I work the 12 steps and I help people every single day. And I'm, uh, you know, the, the Y paws and the young people, you know, everybody asks me, why do you hang out with all those young people? And it's like, man, that's who I am. You know, that's who I am. I'm going to be coming to White Paws my whole entire life as long as I possibly can because there is no age criteria on White Paws. Everybody's like, well, I'm too old to go. I was like, dude, we're all immature. There is no age requirement. You know? I don't know. I just know that by listening to people and talking about service, and it really is important because there's going to be a person here that comes in that has maybe one day. There's going to be a peer, you know, people in here that's, I, at my wife, Paul in Boise, one of my sponsees got loaded, you know, and she's walking around. They're calling me. I'm trying to program. I'm trying to do this. And, you know, I got to take her home and I got to 12 step her right after on Saturday night after the big deal, you know, and, and because it's like no matter what, no matter what, when the hand of AA reaches out, I am responsible. And for that, I'm truly, truly grateful. And thank you for keeping me sober. Thank you very much, Teresa. Now, let's give a sweet Wacky Paul welcome to our main speaker for this evening, JG from Stockholm, Sweden. <laughs> I'm Jay. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jay. We love you, Jay. If you need a book. Lots and lots and lots. What's the book? Ooh. I'm so glad you guys remind me of that. I need to hear it. Never get too old for that. Wow. Whew. It's so nice to be here. I just want to... Uh, explain that I'm an American. I live in Sweden, so if you're wondering where the accent is and you're starting to cop a resentment, you can borrow a pen and I'll meet you outside. You can write about it. And, uh, read it back to me. That'll be my amends. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'm really grateful to be here. I want to thank the host committee. Uh, it's been awesome to be a part of Wacky Paw. And uh, and it means a lot to me to be here with all of you. It also means a lot. There's a lot of friends here that have traveled a, a really long distance uh, to be here at Wacky Pie. I hope you get the opportunity to meet all of them. Uh, young people is uh, is incredible, and it's a worldwide event. So I hope you will uh, come and, and join us and uh, and take part and see the magic of AA being spread worldwide. Um, my sobriety date is February 2nd, 2002, 020202. 02. So, so I'm nine years and 51 weeks today, and, uh, and so excited. Uh, I'll just tell you, when I, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was not a vision for you. I had a, a blonde mohawk and a bad attitude, and I sat in the back of the room, and, and I really didn't think you had a solution. I just thought you were all killing time until you were going to go drink, and if I had to be here, I might as well watch you relapse. So that was my whole plan. And, uh, and I, I had this meeting on Sundays. Uh, I'm jumping ahead, and, and I'll go back to the beginning in a second. But I had this meeting on Sundays, and, and they asked questions after the speaker. And so you know, I'd raise my hand and challenge the speaker all the time. And I'll never forget this one speaker when I, I had very few weeks and uh, sober. And she said, God willing, in, and this is like February. And she said, God willing, in August, I'll be 22 years sober or something like that. And, uh, and I raised my hand and my, I said, I have two questions. First of all, why would God not be willing? And she's like, huh? And then I, <laughs> and then I said, and they keep telling me this whole one day at a time thing. So is 21 years not enough for you that you have to jump ahead to August to be 22 now? And she's, she just looking at me, she goes, you must be new. I was like, ah, that's me. But that's how I was. I was very, like, in your face and, and uh, challenging. I, I come, I have a lot of connection to, to Wacky Paw. I come from Oregon, so. Woo! I come from a tiny little shit town in the Willamette Valley, and I hated it. And I was different, and I was the, the town is very conservative. It's it's very religious. We would 
my brother, sister, and I were raised uh, by a single mom, and it was a very abusive household. We were emotionally, physically, and every kind of abuse there is uh, on a regular basis. And then on Sunday, we'd put on a suit and be dragged to church and then come back home and it'd start all over again. You know, so I don't wear suits. I don't. I can't, I can't stand them. I am not wearing a suit today because I have to speak. I'm wearing this suit because it's an accessory to my tie. And... <laughs> That's what I wanted to wear. I didn't even know we were supposed to wear suits till right before the meeting, actually. But uh, because to me it was hypocrisy. To, you know, you go to church and you and you pray and you say, you know, oh, we're all great and everything like that, and then you come back and you beat your kids and all that stuff and the things that we're doing. I just didn't want anything to do with that. I thought that God is not my God. I don't know what that is, you know. But we were sent to Bible camp and I would memorize books of the Bible and you know and and all this stuff and. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I was, I was a really revengeful child. You know, when, uh, I also want to welcome Texas, by the way, to Wacky Paw. Uh, that single mom is, is, is a Texan, and she took us back to Texas when I was in second grade. That's when my brother told me there was no Santa Claus, and I told him he was adopted. <laughs> I don't want to ruin anything for anyone, but let's just say the answer to both is true. And, uh, you know, and my sister, we moved, we were there for a year and then we moved back to Oregon and, and, uh, it wasn't long after that. My sister had a knee surgery and she, she did something I didn't like. She took the remote control for the TV away from me. So I kicked her in her knee. Yeah, that's how I was. Uh, you know, I dug a moat around the house and I filled it with gasoline and, and <laughs> lit it on fire. That's it. But gas just, gas just sinks into dirt. So really I just lit a bunch of mud on fire and stuff. But, you know, the anger was there. And, uh, I had a message. Uh, yeah. But really what it was is I was so uncomfortable in my own skin. I was, I was, grew up in, in this extremely conservative upbringing where you had to look a certain way, act a certain way, be a certain way, perform a certain way, or you were doomed. You would never succeed in life. No one would love you. You weren't of any value. So I thought, well, if that's the way it's going to be, this is just not the life for me. And when I was 12, I prayed to that God that they had given me, and I said, you know, if you're merciful, take me now. And I went to the medicine cabinet, and I took out a bottle of painkillers because I had seen some, you know, Lifetime movie or whatever. This take a bottle of painkillers, fall asleep, never wake up again. Seemed nice. So I ate a bottle of Sudafed, which I don't know if you know what Sudafed is. But it's the one painkiller that keeps you up. So that was my first experience with speed, unbeknownst to me. And I was just like, uh uh-uh. And I panicked. I was like, I'm not dead. And uh, so I went to my Boy Scout kit, grabbed my X-Acto knife, slit my wrist, and started stabbing myself in the throat over and over and over again. And I just prayed to this God, please take me. And uh, I didn't die, just in case you knew. And... uh, (laughs) And I walked to my mom's room, and the first thing out of my mouth was, I'm a loser. <clears throat> and, uh, and she took me to the hospital, and, uh, you know, they patched me up and everything. And shortly thereafter, I found alcohol. And when I discovered alcohol, you know, it didn't set me free. It just made me not care anymore. And that was the gift I needed. I'm one of those people that believe that alcohol saved my life. I believe that if alcohol did not enter my life when I was 12, I would have tried again. I never did. And, uh, and so I found alcohol and, you know, I didn't drink on a regular basis all the time. Uh, you know, it's just a little here and there just to take the heat off when you're 13 and, you know, you (laughs) pop a wheelie on your bike and it goes astray or something. You're just like, ah, you know, it's too much pressure. Uh, so sneak a Bud Light, you know, and uh, and that's how that's how it was for me. And then I was 16. I just wanted to get out. I just wanted to get out and get away. And when I was 16, uh, I moved to Sweden. There was uh, when I was 15. There was a girl from Gothenburg, Sweden, that was an exchange student to my town. And all I could get from that was, you can go somewhere else. And I just thought. That's what I want to do. So I signed up to be an exchange student to Canada, England, or Australia because I'm a lazy alcoholic and I didn't want to learn a language. And they said they wouldn't take me if I didn't pick a country where I had to learn a language. And the only thing I knew was this girl from Sweden. And I said, sounds good to me. So I went to Sweden and, and I fell in love with the country. And I fell in love with vodka. 
<laughs> so, uh, by the time I came back after that year in Uppsala, Sweden, a little shout out to my Swedish friends here, uh, I was a daily drinker. I was drinking vodka and 7-Up in a sports bottle on a daily basis in high school. I would walk down the halls wearing nothing but boxer shorts and two different colored shoes, singing like fake opera songs I would make up on the spot. You know? They thought I was wacky. <laughs> Little did they know I was wacky pa. You know, I was like, hey. But, uh, you know, and that's what it was. And then as soon as I graduated from high school, I got out of there. I went to San Diego as the first place I could go. Yeah. Woo hoo! I'm going to cover all the states by the time it's done. Uh, I went to San Diego. And within one year, I was homeless and doing whatever I had to do to keep drinking. Yeah. Yeah, yep. <laughs> that's right. So, so that's how it was. Now, if I was one of those people where, you know, you hit the most depressing, disastrous time of your life, and that's when you suddenly wake up and say, oh, I need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, I would have come in then. But that's not the case. For me, I bounced. When I drink, I get liquid courage. I get liquid self-esteem. I get this carefree attitude. I don't care what you think of me if I'm being me, or I don't care how I feel about me if I'm playing whatever part I have to play to believe you love me. So I drink alcohol to be able to get through all of that, and when I power drive through it, I was succeeding. you know. And I started to travel. I ended up... Uh, becoming a flight attendant. My family was in aviation, and I became a flight attendant, and I lived in Europe, and I was flying around, and I'd fly around during the day, and then at night I was running around with our lower companions. And I'm one of those people that, like in the big book where they talk about added a few things to alcohol, I added a few things too recreationally. You know, alcohol is my drug, but I tried everything else except heroin because I wasn't going to use... Ah. <laughs> There's still hope. I... <laughs> I wasn't going to use needles because when I was in Dusseldorf, uh, one of my lower companions uh, OD'd shooting up. And my best alcoholic thinking was get out of there before the cops arrive. But don't leave his jacket because it's really cool. And so that's, that's how I treat my friends. And, uh, and I left. And so I said, I'm never going to shoot drugs because that makes you an alcoholic. And uh, I, was in, I was in Alcoholics Anonymous, actually. I was at a meeting in a log cabin in Los Angeles, and this girl, this girl said, Oh, I only came to Alcoholics Anonymous to learn you could smoke, how to smoke heroin in moderation. And me in the back of the room, I was like, You could smoke it? I'm like, Fuck. So it's waiting out there. I have to stay diligent here. You know, I know what's out there for me. Anyway, so so I'm drinking. That's what I'm doing. I'm drinking. And I ended up going to college and dropping out of college because my career took off. And when my career took off, you know, I got scared because you were going to find out that I wasn't worthy of the career that I had. So I needed to drink to, you know, get rid of that and not care about those feelings and work on. And then I became more successful. And that was just the way it you know, things worked. And at the same time, I was having more and more problems with the law. And I was having more and more problems with, you know, people in general. And, and I was learning to isolate. And, and uh, by the time I got arrested for the last time, I, you know, to me, it, it, it's a really telling moment when I was in jail. And I only knew three phone numbers. My mom that I grew up with, my dad who lived here in Vegas, and my work. I didn't have any friends. I didn't know anybody's phone number. So I had to call work because I wasn't going to call my family. I had to call work. I right? ain't stupid. I had to call. <laughs> Actually, when I was a kid, I used to steal a lot. And we got busted stealing from like a 7, it wasn't 7-Eleven, but like a little local 7-Eleven in my hometown. And uh, the convenience store guy busted me for shoplifting. And he said, I'll give you a choice. I'll call your mom. I'll call the police. I said, call the police. And I was like, but uh, so I called work and I told the, the security guard at work that I had been arrested and I didn't know who to call. Can you look up my friends in the phone book for me? I mean, that's how, you know, lower companions, artificial friends I was. Not that you were to me. I was to you. That's how much you meant to me. And uh, so anyway, I got arrested for the last time in October of 2001. 
and I got sentenced to a choice. I could go to Alcoholics Anonymous or I could go to jail. So I thought about it for four months, <laughs> weighing my options carefully. And I decided, all right, I'll go to Alcoholics Anonymous because jail will be my backup plan. And I figured it would always be there. So I went to my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and uh, you know, I'll never forget it. It was this room in Malibu, California, and they sat, they sat around the table. It wasn't anywhere near where I lived because I didn't want to see me going to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. So uh, they sit around this table, and everybody introduced themselves. And when it got around to the guy on my right, also at his very first meeting, he introduced himself as an addict. And then it got to me, and I said, I, I don't know. And then the guy on my left, who had 20-plus years of sobriety, let us have it. Because we did it wrong. We didn't say the right thing. We didn't know what we are doing. And in the end, the guy on my left and the guy on my right got in a fist fight. And the topic of the meeting was spirituality. And I was like... If this is Alcoholics Anonymous, I think I'm going to reconsider. But what I learned very quickly was it was that old timer that made the mistake. You know, our primary purpose is to carry the message, not the semantics. Now, I'm not talking about outside issues, and I'm not talking about singleness of purpose. I believe in the traditions very strongly. But there's a time and a place. And in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, the place is to carry the message, not, you know, we do it this right way. That's what I grew up with. And, uh, and so I learned, we learn, I learned from our mistakes. And, uh, and I know to welcome everybody at Alcoholics Anonymous who thinks they have a problem with alcohol. And <laughs> oh, well. All right, so uh, my last drink, February 2nd, 2002, I was at dinner. My friends took me out because, uh, you know, we were just going out to dinner. And I went to the bathroom. And when I came back from, from the bathroom, there was a glass of wine in front of my plate. And the reason why is because everybody knew Jay. And Jay drinks. So why did Jay forget to order wine? And the reason Jay forgot was because if Jay drinks, he goes to jail. So Jay didn't tell everyone that. And I'm speaking to myself awkwardly in the third person. But <laughs> they didn't tell anybody that. But... Uh, but that's what that's what it was, you know. I just was trying to be sly about it, and you know, and I walked away when when the drink order was being taken. And, and so when I came back, they had done me the favor of, of ordering me a glass of of wine, and I knew the moment I saw that wine, I would drink it. I knew that that inanimate object was powerful. I knew it was stronger than I was, and it made me feel awful. I had rage inside of me. I don't remember a single thing at dinner that night. All I remember is looking at that glass. I drank the wine, and I thought, you are not even a man. I thought that was the worst feeling on earth. And that's when I knew I was powerless over alcohol. I knew that that alcohol, that there was no way sitting in front of me that I was not going to drink it. There was no single power inside of me that could have kept that from happening. And uh, I was a designated driver, brilliantly, and drove everyone home, burst into tears, prayed to that same God they gave me when I was 12, and I said, it's your fault. I'm a loser. I can't even drink. And I kept going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and the next day I showed up in, in uh, the Palisades and uh, went to a meeting, went to another meeting. And I got into this pattern of going to three meetings a day. I would go to a morning meeting, either at the log cabin or somewhere else, and meeting after work. And then I would go to this great meeting called Late Night. And... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I needed late night. I needed late night. That's me. I was this raging, insane head. I needed to be at a place where nothing was structured in, in, a, in a way of do it right or get the fuck out. That's not what was, was going to keep me coming. And, uh, and what I'm so impressed by is late night, this meeting that is insane and famous, has a GSR. They have service. They make their rent. They stay sober. I'm not going to say how they make their rent, but they make their rent. And they stay sober, you know. So it, it takes all kinds, right? But anyway, I was going to three meetings a day until my 11th day of sobriety, in which every single speaker at all three meetings had relapsed and come back. And I said, okay, if that's what you do in Alcoholics Anonymous, then I'm going to go do that. And this guy had called me, uh, who had taken my number at a meeting, and he, and he had called me and left a message, and I did him the favor of calling him back just to thank him for his message and hang up on him. And he said, what are you, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to go drink. And he said, okay, why? 
And I said, because I've been to three meetings in the day, and everybody drank and came back, so that's what you do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to go do that. Better do it 11 days and 11 years, so I'll be back. And he said he had five years sober and had never had a relapse. And I don't know why I did it, but I said, how'd you do that? And he told me for 45 minutes. (laughs) And all I heard was blah, 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 blah. And then he said the best thing. He said, you know what, you need to call this guy Adam because Adam just came back. And see, Adam has experience. That's what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. We share experience, strength, and hope. And he didn't have the experience of a relapse to be able to tell me what it was like. So he passed me over to this guy, Adam. And I talked to Adam for 45 minutes, listened to him. And I woke up the next day not having drank. And I am one of those people that have not had to drink since then. So you do not have to have a relapse. It is not required in Alcoholics Anonymous. There are people that have stayed sober from their very first meeting. And I'm so grateful for you. And I'm also grateful for the people that have relapsed and come back because you saved my life. You remind me what it's like out there and that it doesn't work and it doesn't get better. And it's no different. And I, and as I joke, not only is that little heroin out there, but do you know how many flavors of absolute vodka they have now? (laughs) I mean, lordy, it's crazy. I do a lot of service in Europe now, and, uh, and I was going to Milan for a, a European region meeting, and the entire bus of everybody from the airport was every single person had just come from an absolute vodka convention in Stockholm, except me. And, and the thing that they had gone for the convention for was not the vodka, but the new line of clothing for the bottle. And, like, they had this little leather jacket, you know, and, like, a little disco thing, and they have this sequin thing for gay pride and stuff. And I thought, who keeps vodka long enough to dress it? <laughs> you know? If I'm going to dress vodka, I'm dressing it with, like, lemon <laughs> so that I can drink it. You know, I was like, I, I didn't get that. Those are not my people. And uh, so anyway... Uh, so that, that guy that, that talked to me that, that had never had a relapse in five years became my first sponsor, and, uh, and he took me through the steps. Step one was fairly easy. I'm one of those people that believe strongly in step zero, the step that I did so many times before I ever came here, the step where I said, I'm sick of this shit, the step where I was sitting in the bar with my last 50 bucks going, how am I going to make rent? You know, And all the times where I said, not tonight, I'm not going to tonight, and then I did. And not understanding that that was the whole alcoholism in effect, you know. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I uh, I was working, I work in television, and I was working on a top ten TV show at the time, and I had this beautiful two-bedroom, two-bath townhouse in the right part of town with no furniture. You know? And that's exactly who I was. Very tall and good-looking on the outside and empty on the inside. It was all facade. And... Uh, and so, woohoo! And uh, <laughs> and so I had this sponsor, and the sponsor started taking me through the steps. And we talked about that last drink, and we talked about the power of alcohol. We talked about the ism and the phenomenon of craving, the obsession of the mind, the allergy of the body. All these things were way too much for me to get in the first days of of my sobriety. But what I did get was, if I showed up and did what you did, I didn't have to drink today, and. I had already tried so many things, all those things in Chapter 3, but just all the things that Jay is, the brilliant guy that he is, thinks he can come up with to not have to drink today, that I knew I was out of answers. So I had no choice but to try it your way. And I'll be honest with you, because that's what we are. We're an honest program. I didn't really try it because I thought it would succeed. I tried it because I thought I'd be able to see, told you so. You know, and uh, so I did. I did what I, I was taught, and I got a service commitment at my meetings. I, I was the greeter at the log cabin. If you've ever been to the log cabin, there's four steps from the ground to the to the floor, and you would walk up those four steps, and I'd be one of the people there going, "Hi, I'm Jay. Hi, I'm Jay. Hi, I'm Jay." And then you'd put your keys on your seat, you would go down, have a cigarette, and you come back in. I'd be like, "Hi, I'm Jay," and they'd be like, "We just did this." I was like, "Yeah, whatever. I don't know you. Go." Yeah. Uh, it's like, I'm just doing my service, you know. And uh, and I made coffee. I made coffee for three years at my Palisades meeting. And, man, I that commitment I eventually came to love. I made five 80-cup pots of coffee and one of water for tea uh, every Sunday. 
And uh, when I moved to Sweden, I met this guy, Patrick, and he's like, dude, I went to this meeting, and it was somewhere near the, the ocean, and they had all this coffee. They had five, and I was like, looked at my calendar. When were you there? I made that coffee. I was so proud. I was like, yes, I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, so we're doing the steps, and obviously after step one, I can't sit there forever because I'm not going to feel, I'm going to feel the fellowship, but I'm not going to feel the freedom. So my sponsor started talking to me about this word God. Now, my background did not respond well to God. But he reminded me that there's more after that. It's God as we understand him. And that means whatever I wanted. So I did the best thing I thought I could possibly do. I bought a goldfish. I bought a goldfish. I named him Jimmy, and Jimmy was my God. And I set him on the table, and I said, all right, Jimmy, what am I going to do today? Am I going to go to a meeting? Am I going to go to work? Do I call a newcomer? I am a newcomer. What am I going to (laughs) do? And I would spend my quality time with Jimmy. And the thing is, it worked. It worked because it's time I finally said, I'm not God. And uh, and that was the best I had to do. I only needed to come that far. I didn't have to do this program perfectly. Uh, I will admit that I had a bowl cleaning accident and I flushed my God. But I bought a new one at the pet store for 99 cents and I was right back in it. Anybody can do that. Then we got to step three. Step three is I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of a higher power. You know, I had Jimmy, you know, and uh, was I willing? And my sponsor was one of those people who said, you can't sit on step three. You know, you can't be working step three. Step three is a decision. You've either made it or you haven't. If you haven't made it, you're on step two. If you have made it, it says we go vigorously into, rigorously into action. So that means I'm on step four. So I had to make a decision. But it's a permanent decision. You don't take it back. It's like giving your kidney to a friend. You don't get to go, eh, you know what, that doesn't work for me anymore. I need that back. <laughs> I made a decision. I have to live with it. If I turn my will and my life over to God, that's it. It's done. I hit my knees in the parking lot of a car mechanic thing with all these guys around, standing there with my sponsor doing the third step prayer because I was willing. And, uh, and then he took me through the fourth step and the fifth step. When I did my fourth step, you know, I I do not believe people relapse over the fourth step. It's not, you know, my experience working with people. I believe it's the fear of the fifth step. But uh, I was sitting there, and, and I thought, I don't have any problem writing down the people I hate and the resentments I have. I don't have any problem telling you about all the sex, but I am not going to admit what I'm afraid of. And uh, so I started with the fear inventory. The first thing I did was I wrote at the top of it, I'm afraid to do this inventory. And uh, and then I busted my ass and I got through my inventory. And then I sat down with my sponsor over two days and I read my inventory. It took one whole day to do my mother. And, uh, and then the other, the other day was everybody else. And uh, when I was done, my sponsor patted me on the back and he said, good job, you want a sandwich? And I said, wait, there's more. I had tucked in my pocket those five secrets the five things I was determined to die with. But I knew right then, I just intuitively knew if I did not get everything out at once, I never would, and then I would never be free. And I was told you will be as thorough as you want to be free, and I want to be free. If you're promising me freedom, I want it. So I'm going to go get it, and here's, here's what I got for you. And I read it, and it was no big deal, and we just carried on. Moved right into six and seven. Oh, my God, six and seven, what's to become of me? All I am is my fears, my sexual conduct, and my resentments. Now you're going to take them all away? Hang on. I'm not done with all of them yet. <laughs> and my sponsor said, you know what? It goes back to step three. If you're not willing to do six and seven, then you're back on two. I said, I'm not going back. Then you're on six and seven. I said, all right, I'm willing. You know? No do-overs. Let's keep moving. <laughs> he said, if there's one thing that can give you a little peace of mind, just remember that it doesn't say God's going to remove all the defects of character. It says it's going to remove the defects of character that God wants to remove. Some of them could still be there because they could be useful. Like I was a little bit of a perfectionist. It's part of my job, which made me really work the steps, you know. So it helped me. So God wasn't ready to remove that, you know. That's cool. I appreciate that. So then I got to eight and nine, made a list of all persons we had harmed. I had started that 
right from day one of my sobriety because I really truly believe that the steps had made a list of all persons who had harmed us and became willing for them to come and make amends to me. So I was ready. I actually had thought I'm going to write a book about it, call it My Apologies. And uh, so I made this list of all persons I, I had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And the first person I wanted to make amends to was my father. And my father lived in Las Vegas at the time. And uh, yeah, I'm nine months sober. It's November. And uh, my sponsor taught me if you're going to go somewhere, you call central office and you set up your meetings ahead of time. So I called central office with my newcomer squeaky voice. And I said, I have to go make amends to my father and I need a meeting. And they said, when are you coming? I said, this weekend. They said, this weekend? I said, yeah. They said, it's Thanksgiving weekend. I said, oh, is it closed? And I said... <laughs> They said, no, it's the Las Vegas Roundup. There's a convention at the Riviera. There's a meeting every hour on the hour for four straight days. And as I was driving from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, I thought, my God is awesome. <laughs> Jimmy started a meeting 30 years before I got sober so that there'd be a convention in Las Vegas when I had to go make amends to my father. <laughs> That's my God working in my life, even before I knew I needed him. So I came out to Las Vegas to make amends, made amends to my father and my stepmother, who I'm very excited to say is here today. And, uh, yeah. So it's, a, <laughs> I love this. So I'm making amends to my father and, he, and, and, and Renee, and, and, and he slams his hand down on the table and he goes, let sleeping dogs lie, and he walks out of the room. Because I had just gotten done telling him how much money I had stolen from him. And as soon as, as soon as he walks out of the room, my stepmom turns to me and she goes, Are you sure that's all you owe? <laughs> that's the best. <laughs> I made my amends to my father. I wrote a lot of checks on a regular basis, and I ended up, he sent them all back. And so I made personal amends. I showed up. I would drive out to Vegas. I set up their computer once. They only had a dial-up connection. <laughs> That's making amends. But uh, <laughs> just want to say. Uh, but I showed up, and I, and I constantly would drive out here, and I was scared to death. I wanted more than anything for my father to love me and for my father to know I loved him. And, and uh, <clears throat> so I just kept coming. Sometimes it was awkward. He was very, my dad was an active alcoholic. He was very into sports and stuff like that. We would play place bets. We'd do parlays and stuff. He would study the paper and know what teams to play, and I would pick them based on themes like, ooh, Americana, Patriots, Cowboys, Indians, that'll work. You know? <laughs> but I don't study any of that stuff, you know? But uh, so anyway, I just showed up, and that, and that was uh, kind of the relationship I had with my father. And uh, my father passed away five years ago. Now, my father is an example to me in so many ways, but he's also a sad example to me of the power of alcoholism. My dad was an active alcoholic. He never got sober. He told me a story once when he got sick that the doctor told him to quit smoking and quit drinking. He turned to the doctor and said, pick one. And uh, the doctor picked smoking. And my dad drank until he died. You know, and alcoholism is a powerful thing, and it affects a lot of families. And, and uh, I, told, I told Renee I was going to tell this, and she knows that. She's got a religion in her life that's working, that's wonderful, and, and she loves it, and, and she's doing her service there. But she set all that aside while she was married to my dad. You know, she she says it was her choice. But we know as alcoholics how we manipulate people, whether they know it or not. And I know that that, that was uh, my dad, my atheist father, alcoholic's effort, you know. Uh, but we had a relationship before he died, and, and, uh, and I'm so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous because no matter what went unsaid, I know that that street was clean. And that just meant so much to me, you know. And uh, I ended up uh, moving. I moved to Australia first. Uh, I wanted to go to Sweden. It was my dream to go to Sweden. I desperately wanted to go to Sweden all my life uh, since I was that teenager, but I just couldn't make the leap. I was a successful person in my field, and, and I just couldn't make the leap. So no to, and I packed my bags, and I went to Australia. And I actually moved to this island called Thursday Island, which is in the far north of Queensland. It's an indigenous island uh, of indigenous islanders. And uh, <laughs> funny how that worked out. And... Uh, 
And so I'm up there, and there's no Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, so I joined a thing called Loners and Internationalists, which is available from New York, and where you actually are writing to other alcoholics that are in the same situation. You know, it's, it's where you can identify with that remoteness. And then once a month, I would take two boats and a plane and fly down to Cannes and go to a meeting. I'd fly down on Friday, and I would go to a meeting on Saturday, and I'd reverse it on Sunday. So that was my $700 AA meeting once a month. And... Uh, and I would go to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, do loners and internationalists and write about it and stuff. And I also tried to do, you know, what Bill and Bob did with alcoholic number three. I tried to go to the hospital and find alcoholics. And I said, are there any alcoholics here? And they said to me, yes, lots, but they won't talk to you because there's a political issue, you know, still going on in alcohol in uh, Australia because of the history there. And uh, so I couldn't do anything directly to help the indigenous islander alcoholics. So all I did was uh, I ended up moving to Sweden after that. When my project was over, I left all of the grapevines and the literature and the big books in the library. I would go to the library and I would be reading a grapevine, and then I would just just leave it out on the table. Just go to leave. Oh, whoops, sorry. Was I supposed to put that away? I don't know. And uh, and I checked in with some friends that were there uh, in Australia later, and uh, somebody had found books in the library and started a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. So it can go old school sometimes, you know. It can go back to the beginning. It's like how A started in L.A., you know. But uh, I went from that. Woo, I went. Uh, I went from Sweden to I'm from Australia to Sweden because I figured my bags are packed. And I got to Sweden and I had to apply for my visa. And I got into Alcoholics Anonymous. I was joined joined the international group there, the English speaking group, as I was working on my Swedish. And I was also applying for my visa, and the, the country of Sweden had the nerve to tell me that I had to go back to America to apply for my visa to live in Sweden. And I thought, well, that's just rude. I'm already here. And they said, well, we don't have special rules for you, so you have to go back to America, and we'll take your application there and then decide. And I begrudgingly said, fine. Because I kind of figured out in the end they would win. So I went back to America. <laughs> And I sent in for my visa. I also went to the doctor because I thought, you know, while I'm here and I don't have health care in Sweden, so, so I'll go to the doctor. And uh, to make a long story short, the doctor found cancer. And I got taken care of while I was waiting. And then I got my visa. I went back to Sweden. One of the things that the doctor told me was that if I had waited six months, the cancer would have spread and I would be dead within two years. There would be nothing they could do. I never would have gone to the doctor if I hadn't gone back to America because I didn't need to. I just went to get a physical. So grateful for Sweden that they forced me to go back to America. As soon as I, as soon as I got back to Sweden, they changed the law. You no, no longer have to leave the country to apply for your visa. I still believe that's my God, once again, doing for me what I could not do for myself. That shit happens to me all the time. And I can see God in everything. And that's what I love. You know, And the best place for me to see God now in my life is working with others, being of service. You know, I am so blessed to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in Europe. We have phenomenal AA, but we have a variety of AA. I live in uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. In Sweden, there are 9 million people. I'm looking at my Swedish friends. 9 million people. There's 15,000 members of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have a lot of great meetings. We have a lot of great conventions and fellowship. In Norway, there's uh, 5 million people, approximately. There's 2,000 members of Alcoholics Anonymous. In Reykjavik, or I should say in Iceland, the country of Iceland, there's 35,000 Alcoholics Anonymous members in a country of 350,000 people. So (laughs) 1 in 10 people in Iceland are in AA. (laughs) They have their own radio station. (laughs) But then there's places like Romania, where there's 27 million people and there's 400 people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've met both young people in Romanian AA. (laughs) There's not even AA in Albania yet, you know. The people in Europe are doing amazing things in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we started Yuripa, the All Europe Young People in AA Convention. I just want to tell you about that, because you guys have a, a responsibility 
for that here in Wacky Paw. See, we had Young People's Conventions in, in Sweden. Young People's was started, you know, a long time ago, and then it sort of went away, and then it came back again. And uh, we had this uh, Sweden Young People's Convention in Swedish, and then the following year we had a Young People's Convention that was a little bit more international. We had a Swinglish. We had English and Swedish going on. And at that point we decided, let's just make the leap. Let's start All Europe Young People in AA, and let's spread this message, and let's spread this fellowship. So we did, uh, but you know we didn't know how to do it, and we could have gone to Ikipa, but I don't believe there's any original members of the original starting committee of Ikipa around. But Wakipa still has a lot of original members, and it was actually the year before we became Yuripa. Uh, a couple of them were there in Stockholm with us, participating in our international convention, and they helped us and they hooked us up with Wakipa Advisory in Eugene. And we came, I came, uh, as well as a, a friend from Ireland, and we got to meet you guys and find out how to develop a young people's convention. And so we developed Yuripa. Yuripa, the very first Yuripa was in 2010 in Stockholm. There was 566 people from 30 countries. We spoke 13 languages. The youngest sobriety was 16 years of age, day one. And the oldest was 82 with 52 years of sobriety. That's pretty awesome. Uh, the person who had their very first day was uh, Belgian. She went to her first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, a French-speaking meeting that we had at Yuri Pa, and she, and she found the fellowship. It was remarkable. We also had a person come from the Ukraine to talk about how they need help. There's nobody that can carry 12-step messages in the Ukraine. They don't have enough experience, strength, and hope there. Could we come and do workshops? So people did. People went to the Ukraine and did workshops on the 12 steps. Uh, we had a big book fund where people put coins in and stuff like that to buy literature. We bought $250 worth of big books in Romania to fill the libraries. Because if you think your big book is expensive here, the big book in Sweden is 150 crowns divided by seven. $25 in Sweden. In Romania, it's about the same. But in Romania, they make a, you know about... I don't know, a lot, a very little money. So it's, it costs you like a week's pay to buy a big book. So big books and libraries is crucial. Uh, Yuri Pa thankfully has thrived and grown. Uh, thanks to that friend from Ireland, it went to Ireland the following year. It's the first time ever in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous Ireland they've had a young person's anything. So that was a remarkable moment in history. Uh, there is now young peoples in Lithuania, Scotland, the United Kingdom is developing, and of course, you know, Sweden is kick-ass. After, because <laughs> we are, after, after Ireland, the people that started the Young People's uh, Conventions in, in Stockholm, we thought, wait a minute, we started these conventions and now we don't have one in Stockholm. So they started Skankipa. Skankipa is the all-Scandinavia convention of young people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and so we had the very first one this last, uh, just weeks ago in, in Stockholm, uh, which was like 250 people, the self-supporting, there was people that came from America and all over. Uh, and the next one will be January 4th to 6th in Reykjavik. So we hope you'll join us. The next Yuri Pa will be this summer in July in Copenhagen. You know, you guys, I want to tell you, you, if you have not been to a place that doesn't have AA and have the opportunity to carry the message and, and that vitality, it is a experience you must not miss. It is so invigorating and it is so rewarding to see what you are a part of. This is a fellowship of two million people. You have friends all over the world. You just haven't met them yet. And, and we're here for you. And, uh, and I want to tell you, I want to invite you to come and be supportive and, and help that out, whether you come in person or by Skype or in contact with people when they come to your meetings. There are a lot of people from Europe here this weekend and, and other countries. I was also at the very first Aussie Paw hey, in Australia, in Melbourne. It's going to be in Queensland next. Uh, but, uh, you know, make them feel welcome and, and carry the message. But I also want to tell you one thing, one word of caution, and that is, you know, we share our experience, strength, and hope with each other. Let's try to keep our opinions to ourselves. 
we have a unique situation in Europe. You know, doing an all European convention means that we have to deal with 30 GSOs, not one, not two. 30. So we have different rules, different trustees, different systems, different conferences that we have to work through. So what works here doesn't exactly duplicate and copy over there. You have to adapt these things. So help us share your experience, strength, and hope, and, and support us as we grow and, and thrive. Um, you know, I, I don't know really what more to to talk about. I, I know I'm forgetting probably a, a thousand things I want to say. Really, my message about Alcoholics Anonymous is that no matter where you go, AA does not drop you. You know, I've been on a remote island and had Alcoholics Anonymous in my heart and present. And I've been all over the world now and, and been to Alcoholics Anonymous. My favorite story is, is, is doing outreach for Skanky Paw. And I'm on a business trip in Auckland, New Zealand, having a miserable time. And all I kept thinking about in my head was, how are we going to outreach the Fao Islands? I mean, who the hell lives on the Fao Islands? I, that's part of Scandinavia. We got to get there. We, we have an obligation to carry the message. We need to outreach to the Fao Islands. So I'm sitting in this meeting in Auckland and I thought, you know, I haven't heard a word anybody's saying. All I'm thinking about is who the hell lives in the Fao Islands? And the guy sitting to my left was from the Fao Islands. <laughs> Not kidding. <laughs> And not only that, but he was moving to Sweden a year from now, and he was thinking, how the hell is the fellowship in Sweden? <laughs> and I was right beside him. You know, that's God. So I just want to welcome everybody. I hope you have an awesome convention. I liked what somebody said about uh, if you see some, I think it was Brian, if you see someone sitting by themselves. You know, my first convention ever, uh, I was isolating, and uh, there was a pool and everyone was having ice cream and stuff, and I was sitting by myself, and I called my sponsor whining, and I said, nobody wants me here. And uh, my sponsor said, look around, is anybody else sitting by themselves? I said, yeah, there's one other person. He goes, you know, if you go over and sit with them, neither one of you will be alone. And I said, all right, whatever. So I went over and sat next to them. I said, hey, my sponsor said I have to come sit by you. My name's Jay, I'm an alcoholic. And they said, hi, I'm Ted, and I'm in Al-Anon. And I said, oh. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. And, uh, you know, but Alcoholics Anonymous is fantastic, and, and we, we have a message and a duty and a responsibility to stay sober and to stay free and to stay happy, joyous, and free. So thank you so much for letting me be here. God bless. Thank you, Jay. Now I've asked Letitia M. to read a vision for you. Alcoholic. We love you, Leticia. Lots and lots and lots. Oh, <sighs> a vision for you. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize that we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come <laughs> if your own house is in order. But obviously, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right. And great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. That's horrible. <laughs> 
Um, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Let's, all, let's thank all of our participants and Jay again for sharing their stories tonight. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.